Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, proud citizens of vast early America, and the primary partners in the Georgian Papers program. The Georgian Papers program aims to digitize, interpret, and make available an extraordinarily rich collection of correspondence, maps, and royal household ledgers created by the Georgian kings of England and their families. This program is really big because It seeks to make available its approximately 350,000 items to the world. Digital access to this collection promises to really change our understanding of the Georgian period and of 18th and early 19th century North America. Now, as part of its contribution to this program, the Omohundro Institute is sending scholars to Windsor Castle, where they work alongside rail archivists as they seek to gain greater insight into these rich materials. Now, when asked about her experiences working with royal archivists, Cynthia Kierner, who's a professor of history at George Mason University, responded that the Georgian papers gave her a deeper understanding of the Georgian era. She noted how letters exchanged between King George III and Lord North, for instance, conveyed a real sense of just how deeply involved George III was in the daily work of his government, and at how much George III truly believed in the sovereignty of Parliament. Soon, you'll be able to look at these letters between George III and Lord North, too, because Thanks to the support of the Omohundro Institute, they'll be digitized for all to see and use. For more information about the Georgian Papers program and the Omohundro Institute's support of it, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Georgian Papers. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Kovar. Hello, and welcome to episode 140 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Have you ever heard of the sayings, it's not rocket science, or you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out? Well, before these sayings came about in the mid to late 1940s, early Americans had a similar saying. You don't have to be Nathaniel Bowditch to figure it out. But who is Nathaniel Bowditch and how did he come to be associated with difficult tasks? Nathaniel Bowditch was a man who wore many hats. He was a navigator, mathematician, astronomer, and business innovator. He was the man early Americans considered to be their Sir Isaac Newton. He was also a man whose greatest impact on early American life has carried forth into our present day. Only, his contributions to early American society have largely been forgotten as they become so commonplace in our own society. Using details from her book, Nathaniel Bowditch and the Power of Numbers, How a 19th Century Man of Business, Science, and the Sea Changed America, Tamara Thornton, a professor of history at the University of Buffalo, takes us on an exploration of the life and work of Nathaniel Bowditch. Now, during our exploration, Tamara reveals who Nathaniel Bowditch was, and why he was so famous during the 19th century, details about Bowditch's maritime life and business work, and Nathaniel Bowditch's greatest contributions to early American society and to our own present-day lives. But first, are you ready to meet up in Philadelphia and Anaheim? I sure am. And although I still need to solidify plans for our meetups, I know when they'll take place. The Philadelphia meetup will take place on Saturday, July 22nd at 4.30 p.m. or sometime thereafter. And the Anaheim meetup will take place on Tuesday, August 22nd, also sometime in the evening. I'd love your help planning these informal gatherings, and I'd also love to know that you plan on coming. So please join the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook, which you can do by clicking on that link in your Ben Franklin's World app, or by clicking on the orange Join Now button on the BenFranklin'sWorld.com homepage. Or you can also just send me an email. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com so we can coordinate with each other. All right, are you ready to discover early America's Sir Isaac Newton? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is a professor of history at the University of Buffalo. Her research interests include early American cultural and intellectual history. Plus, she's the author of three books, including Handwriting in America, A Cultural History, and, most recently, Nathaniel Bowditch and the Power of Numbers, How a 19th Century Man of Business, Science, and the Sea Changed America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Tamara Thornton. 
Nice to be here. Thanks for having me, Liz. So, Nathaniel Bowditch. In the 19th century, many Americans knew who he was, but today, he's not that well known. Tamara, would you provide us with an overview of who Nathaniel Bowditch was and why so many Americans knew about him in the 19th century? Well, this was a man who wore a lot of hats. He was a New Englander. He was born in Salem, Massachusetts on the eve of the Revolution. He went around the world five times on trading voyages, but he was also an expert in maritime navigation, and he was a mathematician and an astronomer. And probably most unexpectedly, he headed up two insurance and investment companies. So he was also an innovative business executive. But in his time, he was really famous for a couple of things. One was the book he wrote, first published in 1802, The New American Practical Navigator. And this was a nautical manual, a practical manual. It was really a must-have for every commercial and naval vessel in America. It was a maritime bestseller. You can find lots of copies of this still. And interestingly enough, you'll see just how used these copies were. Lots of pencil marks in the margins and seawater stains, that kind of thing. This was not something that was on somebody's shelf. This went on vessels. So everybody knew the practical navigator. He was also, though, a mathematician and astronomer. And here's where we don't remember him, though. This is where Bowditch really wanted to be remembered. And Americans thought of Bowditch as their nation's answer to Isaac Newton. You know, they considered him to be a mathematical whiz. In the same way that we'd say, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to get this, or you don't have to be an Einstein, they would say, you don't have to be Nathaniel Bowditch to know X, Y, and Z. When you look at what he actually did as a mathematician and astronomer, this is not an original person. This is not even a particularly well-published person, but he did publish some, and he got European honors for what he published, and Americans were thrilled with that. They figured, now we finally have our American equivalent of Isaac Newton. So he was known as an American mathematician, and he was known for that practical navigator. Sailor, mathematician, business innovator, Bowditch sounds like he was really into numbers. Was an interest in numbers typical of early Americans, or was Nathaniel Bowditch just different in his interests? Well, he was a peculiar man in some ways. He always loved numbers, even as a child. He was into numbers. But Americans in general in his era in the late 1700s, early 1800s, were not that much into numbers. We think of numbers, quantitative education, STEM. Of course, this is a part of a not just a basic education, but an advanced education. It didn't work that way in those days. I mean, yes, people knew how to add and subtract if you had any kind of education, but beyond that, not a whole lot. The people who knew more math knew math for very practical reasons. They were navigators or they were surveyors or most commonly they were in some kind of commerce or trade where they had to do business arithmetic and they had to do bookkeeping. And remember, business arithmetic in this period when you have multiple currencies, multiple systems of weights and measures, and none of them are decimal, this actually gets very complicated. So it's very practically oriented people who do the math. If you want to go to Harvard, on the other hand, where you're going to train to be a minister or a lawyer or a gentleman, you don't even need to know so much as basic arithmetic until the very beginning of the 1800s. So math had a very different place. It was practical rather than scholarly in this era. Bowditch took to numbers right away, though. He always enjoyed them. He was always good at them. He was known for feats of mental arithmetic. People would give him really, really tough problems that would take you or I hours to do with pencil and paper, and he would do them in his head in a few minutes, out would come the answer, and that at the time was considered to be a sign of genius. How did Bowditch learn about mathematics? I mean, it sounds like math wasn't really a part of the standard school curriculum that you would find in early Salem, Massachusetts. So how did he go about learning the advanced mathematics that really interested him? Well, he did get some very basic stuff in common schools as a little child, but he really learned 
math in a couple of stages. First, he became an apprentice in a ship chandlery, which is basically a shop that caters to ocean-going vessels. It doesn't sell the big stuff like sails, but it sells the little stuff like pots and pans and scrub brushes and log books and things like that. And it's a business, and it's a training ground for people who are going into maritime commerce. So his bosses make sure that he gets the right kind of education, which is this practical, mathematically oriented education. He studies bookkeeping. He studies surveying. He studies something called gauging, which is how to figure out the volume of a barrel. And he studies navigation, very quantitative stuff. So he learns that kind of practical, we would think of it as applied math. There is, of course, scholarly math going on in this period, not in America, but there is in Europe. You know, calculus is being developed. So where does he learn that kind of stuff? He learns that really through self-education. He gets access to some local gentlemen's libraries, one of which, through some serendipitous turn of events, happens to have a very advanced European library of cutting-edge mathematics and science, and he gets access to those libraries because he has contacts, and they see he's a smart man who's good with numbers. They say, here, take a look at these books, and he teaches himself this stuff. That involves learning Latin. It involves learning French. He gets some help there, too, but this is a motivated young man. Because for him, numbers are the be-all and end-all. They're his religion. They're his spirituality. They have aesthetic meaning to him. Anything with numbers, he's going to take to. So he gets his practical education first as an apprentice. And then he gets this pretty unique scholarly education by teaching himself in these private local libraries. Earlier, you noted that Bowditch was a sailor that he sailed to the Indian Ocean five times, and that he published a well-known and well-used navigation manual for sailors called A New American Practical Navigator. If Bowditch was apprenticed in a chandlery, how did he learn how to sail and navigate the seas? Right. He takes navigation classes, and what that involves is not so much the practical, put up this sail, do that kind of thing, which he's never very good at. Actually, he never really learns how to maneuver vessels. What he learns is how to steer by the stars, how to go from point A to point B halfway around the world and always know what your latitude and longitude are. That's a skill that's a mathematical skill, and that is what he studies in navigation class. Now, when Bowditch sailed to the Indian Ocean, he sailed as something called a supercargo. Tamara, would you tell us about Bowditch's experiences at sea and what he did as a supercargo? Yeah, supercargo is a business agent for the vessel. You know, when Americans were just sailing to the Caribbean in fairly small vessels, the captain could double as the business agent. But when you're sailing into the Pacific or Indian Oceans, things get a whole lot more complicated. And you need somebody whose specialty really is the wheeling and dealing. That's what a supercargo does. And that's what Bowditch did. These voyages must have been eye-popping for him. Here's a young man who's never been out of New England, well into his early 20s. As far as we know, he went to Boston, he went to Cambridge, he went to Rhode Island and Connecticut, nothing else. And all of a sudden, he's on this vessel going into the Indian Ocean and seeing societies he had never seen before. He ends up in his first voyage on this little dot in the middle of the Indian Ocean called Réunion. We still haven't really heard of it, except that there's a bunch of wreckage from that Malaysian Airlines that crashed that wound up on the shores of Réunion. So Réunion popped up in the news for a moment. But Bowditch ends up there in the mid-1790s. He sees plantation slavery, which he'd never seen. He sees Roman Catholic churches. No such thing in Yankee New England. He sees these French colonials, because it's a French island, who have very different ways than Yankees do. They openly have mistresses. They flirt. The women talk about their pregnancies. They make dirty jokes. He's pretty shocked. But there's a lot that he also sees that fascinates him. When he's in Manila in the Philippines, for example, he has to do business with Chinese 
merchants. That's part of his job as a supercargo. But he's fascinated with their system of numbering, of course, and with the abacus. In fact, he buys himself an abacus. Wherever he goes, he's always on the lookout for numbers. Given that mathematics is the universal language, I mean, the only language shared among cultures, it seems like Bowditch must have been a successful supercargo given his passion for numbers. I mean, he could always relate and communicate with people via numbers. Yeah, it's the universal language, but it also took a lot of social skills and social savvy to do this kind of trade because you are dealing with complete strangers. I mean, the Chinese are strange to Americans. The Chinese trading mores are different. That's true wherever he goes. And in this era, when they're used to, I mean, Salem is a little town. And when you come from Salem, you're used to dealing face to face with people you know. You may not like those people. They may be villains in your eyes, but you know them because you grew up with them. Now, you go to Manila or you go to Indonesia or you go to Reunion, you're dealing with people who you've never met before. They may be of different religions, ethnicities, races, and you don't know who you're dealing with. So you have got a problem of trust here. So quite beyond the bottom line, adding up the figures, you also have to add up the people and try to figure out what they're up to in order to make a good deal. And you have to figure out what's going to sell in this market and what is there to buy. You know, the Americans have never been to the Philippines. They go to Manila, the stuff that's on Bowditch's vessel, they have a hard time unloading. Nobody wants to buy this stuff. And they're not exactly sure what they're going to bring back in return. They find a product, but they didn't know exactly what they were going to find. Would you tell us more about the work that brought Bowditch to the attention of so many Americans, the publication of that New American Practical Navigator? What kinds of information does the book contain, and how was Bowditch able to apply everything that he learned while at sea, like how to navigate by the stars, in writing this book. Well, it's a big volume. It's several hundred pages long, and it's chock full of really everything you need to know in order to operate an ocean-going vessel. So how to survey a coastline, what marine insurance is all about. It also gives you some basic mathematics education. But most of it is devoted to how to navigate across the ocean, figuring out your latitude and longitude, this celestial navigation. And that involves making observations with nautical instruments. So that's precision work. And what you're doing is you are looking up at the sky, the stars, the moon, trying to figure out distances. And you're doing this on a vessel that's going back and forth (laughs) on the waves. So it's tough. And then you take those observations, the numbers you get from your instruments, and you plug them into formulae along with a bunch of other numbers, and you do calculations. And they're pre-calculated numbers that you find in tables that are in this book. So if you open up that book, most of the book consists of tables of pre-calculated numbers that you plug in. Okay, so this involves book learning, really. Bowditch, the very first time he went on board a vessel, he knew how to navigate it because he had studied this kind of navigation. And he brought along a book like this with him so that he could do that kind of navigation. Now, when he puts together his book, The New American Practical Navigator, most of this is not original. I mean, how could it be if most of it is numbers, right? You don't want it to be original. You want it to be accurate. And the thing about Bowditch's Navigator, the one he publishes, is that it's more accurate than its predecessors. And what it really is, is Bowditch taking a copy of the old manual, which was called The New Practical Navigator. It was written by an Englishman named John Hamilton Moore. He takes this with him. And he goes through every number and recalculates them, figures out the correct number. So it's really a revised version of the older book. But it's so much better, mainly because it's more accurate in its numbers, that his publisher says, you know what, let's put this under your name, the heck with more, it's Bowditch now, and let's call it the new American Practical Navigator. Bowditch sounds like he was a really complex guy. I mean, he was into higher level math at a time when most Americans were not, and he seems to have been good at it besides. I believe I read in your book, Nathaniel Bowditch and the Power of Numbers, 
that he corrected more than 8,000 errors in Moore's Practical Navigator. And yet, Bowditch wasn't just a mathematician. He also seems like he was a gregarious individual if he was to go off to all these far-off lands and trade successfully as a supercargo. I mean, he had to have been at least somewhat of a people person to read these foreign merchants and to see how he could make a good deal. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely a person who's driven by numbers and driven by systematic thinking. Sometimes in his dealings with people, he could be quite pinched. If they weren't following his system, he could get very irritable and quite self-righteous about it. So often he can seem like an automaton, frankly. He must have driven people nuts. And in fact, we knew he could drive people nuts. On the other hand, in his private life, he was actually a very loving husband, a loving father. He worried about his children later on in life. One of his sons goes to Harvard and gets into trouble with the administration. Just a little mischievousness here and there, you know, things like dropping a cannonball from an upper window, burning down an outhouse. But he's kicked out temporarily and Bowdish is just horrified. He's like every other overwrought parent. So when you get behind the scenes, you can see He's a real human being with real relationships. But once he puts that math hat on, he's somebody completely different. In fact, even his family said that when he was at home in his study, working, doing math, you really could not disturb him. That was it. He was being Nathaniel Bowdish, mathematician. But then he would take off the mathematician hat and he would be husband, father, friend. You mentioned that Bowditch's Practical Navigation Manual contains sections about practical navigation, including how to use marine insurance. Was it Bowditch's knowledge of insurance that inspired him to take a job with the Essex Fire and Marine Insurance Company after his life at sea? He knew how this business worked, yes, but he certainly wasn't the only one who knew how this business worked. The companies that hired him liked him not just because of his business skills, his supercargo skills. That's important, yes. But they also liked him as a person with a reputation as a mathematician. Mathematicians were believed to be methodical, organized, objective. And that kind of personality and that kind of reputation has a value apart from one's skill set or substantive knowledge. And that reputation actually becomes even more important later in his life in the 1820s and 30s when he moves to Boston to head up an even bigger and more consequential corporation. Bowditch did have a reputation for systematizing things. And I wonder if he would tell us how marine insurance worked and about how Bowditch systematized the way it worked. So he works in the marine insurance industry. A marine insurance company, of course, insures cargoes, insures vessels. Behind the scenes, they're also just engaged in general finance because they are investing in bank stock. They're investing in government stock. So it's a general financial corporation. Yes, it's incorporated, so it sounds pretty sophisticated. But in the early 19th century, it's still true that companies, even corporations, run in a pretty lackadaisical way, a surprisingly lackadaisical way. If you look at paperwork, for example, office organizational systems, they're practically non-existent. If you want to get a marine insurance policy from a company, usually your request would be an oral request. You might even go see Bowditch in the evening at his home to talk about it. The paperwork is quite minimal. It's handwritten. Bowditch wanted things to run like clockwork, though. In his first job with the Essex Fire and Marine Insurance Company in the 18 zeros and 10s, He begins to do some of that systematization. You see that more with his second job in Boston in the 20s and 30s. But meanwhile, you see his passion for systematization in the work he does for a private organization in Salem called the East India Marine Society, which is a society made up just of captains and supercargoes who have gone into the Indian and Pacific Ocean. So these are the big shots of Salem, the major characters. And Bowditch takes over their logbook operation. 
He believes that logbooks should be standardized in format, so he issues blank forms for these logbooks, printed blank forms. may not sound like a big deal, but printed forms of any kind were actually quite rare in this period. Again, most paperwork was handwritten, one of a kind, on some scrap of paper. So he wants to standardize the logbooks. He numbers them in sequence. And then he goes after the Marine Society's artifact collection, which is actually the basis for Salem's Peabody Essex Museum today. Fabulous collection. But it's a complete mess when Bowditch finds it. And so he systematically catalogs it. He puts accession numbers on everything. Again, the idea of numbering artifacts in a collection seems second nature to us. But it wasn't then. These were real innovations to systematize things, numerate things. But that was his modus operandi. So he's interested in standardization, regularization, systematization. That's his calling card. And you see it first at the East India Marine Society. You see it a little bit with his work with that marine insurance company. And then in the 20s and 30s, when he works for a financial corporation in Boston, he really goes to town with standardization and quantification. Yeah. Would you tell us about the financial organization that Bowditch left Salem to work for? When I read Nathaniel Bowditch and the Power of Numbers, it struck me that the work must have been the opportunity of a lifetime because Bowditch was born in Salem, lived in Salem, and was really just devoted to his hometown, and then he packed up and left for Boston. Yeah, he's definitely devoted to Salem. And others have tried to lure him away before. Harvard asked him to be a professor. No. West Point, no. University of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson himself asking him, no. Not interested in being a professor. You know, he is used to Salem. He is a local kid. And he's making good money in Salem. And his job with that marine insurance company is not particularly demanding of his time. So he is able to do his science and math as well as be a corporate executive. So it's going to take a lot to get him to move away. But the offer that he gets in 1823 from this Boston Financial Corporation is an offer he can't refuse. They give him a lot of money, and he's still going to have time to do his math and science. And at the same time, Salem is becoming eclipsed by Boston. And people are beginning to desert it, to go to the big time now, which really is Boston. So it's not a surprise that he leaves at this point. And he takes a position with a company that becomes, under his watch, the largest financial corporation in New England, which is a big deal at this point. Bowditch leaves Salem and goes to Boston to work for the Massachusetts Hospital Life Insurance Company. Tamara, would you tell us more about this company and how Bowditch was able to build it up so that it resembled what we would recognize as a company today? So its name is the Massachusetts Hospital Life Insurance Company, which is really about as misleading a name as you can get. It has very little to do with the Massachusetts General Hospital. It sells very little life insurance. Really, it's business, and it's the first of its kind in this. Its business is trusts and investments. Again, this is stuff we do every day now, trusts and investments, but this is really quite pathbreaking in its day. It pools all the money of those elite Bostonians, the Boston Brahmins, the ones building those textile mills. It pools their money in trust accounts, and then that money is invested to make it last over generations, which it has, and that money is also invested in those same industrial enterprises, so it's win-win. So that's what it's doing. Why do they want Bowditch? Well, we can say, okay, he's got business experience from Salem. And again, that's true. They liked his business experience, but even more, and they were quite open about this, they liked his credentials as a mathematician. Now, this is a fairly controversial job in its job duty. For starters, when you are pooling capital, you're pooling the money of the Lowells and the Cabots and the Higginsons, you better not show favoritism. You can't favor the Lowells over the Cabots and the Cabots over the Higginsons. 
a mathematician, a person of numbers, a man associated with objectivity, the objectivity that goes with numbers, well, that's just the guy you want to show your impartiality. The other thing that's controversial about this job is that now you are dealing not just with other fellow elites, not just with merchants and industrialists. Many of the investments in this era are in the form of mortgage loans to ordinary farmers in the western part of the state. And many of these same farmers are very anti-corporate. They see corporations as monopolies. And there's a lot of pushback against the mortgage loans that Bowditch is authorizing. And there's pushback against his company as being a monopolistic villain. But if you can say, hey, you might not like these rules, sometimes it might mean that we foreclose on a loan, but you know what? I am enforcing these rules impartially. I'm enforcing them on elite Bostonians in the same way that I'm enforcing them with common farmers from Berkshire County, Massachusetts. I'm a mathematician. I know all about objectivity and impartiality. I've studied the solar system that runs by rules that are invariable and regular and play no favorites. So they like this image of the Newtonian scientist and mathematician running their corporation. That reputation is going to serve them well. What was it about business, insurance, trusts, and investments that captivated Bowditch's attention? Because throughout our conversation, you've made it clear that Bowditch was really passionate about math and numbers. And yet, he turned down opportunities to teach and study math and numbers full-time as a professor at Harvard, West Point, or the University of Virginia? Well, teaching at Harvard then is not what teaching at Harvard now is like. You're teaching a bunch of teenagers. You're not teaching them at a very advanced level. These are kids who get into food fights. It's not particularly attractive. There's not a lot of prestige associated with being a professor. You're not very well paid. You're overworked. You don't have time to do your own stuff. There's no expectation of a research agenda. For a person like Bowditch, it's actually a pretty lousy job. So he doesn't have a hard time saying no. On the other hand, with this job in Boston, he gets to bring his systematizing instincts to things. So he gets pretty obsessed with overhauling office procedures, for example. You know, he's really a mathematician by temperament as much as by his skill level. So he brings his mathematical temperament to office procedures. So, for example, what is the first thing he does when he assumes his job? He wants a whole bunch of blank forms printed up. He says, I'm no longer accepting loan applications that come in on handwritten scraps of piece of paper. I want them on the forms. We must have system. And then he tells all the agents, I want you to number all the loans. And I don't want you to refer to the loan by the person's name. I want a number. And then I want you, when you write me about these loans, I want each letter to discuss only one loan by number, fold up the letter, put the number on the outside, and then I can take all the letters with the same number and bundle them together. This might sound like a long way around to us, but this is in the days before filing cabinets, file folders, paper clips, staplers, any of these things. There really are only very primitive office organizational systems. And Bowditch brings his mathematizing, systematizing ways to offices and really sets in motion a systematization of business that we take for granted today. He also sets in motion a systematization and regularization of business conduct that we take for granted today. Things like due dates. You know, your loan is due on this particular date. Well, we accept that. You know, we're not trying to bargain with the credit card company about when our visa bill is due. But in those days, people didn't take those due dates particularly seriously. But Bowditch did. You know, he said, well, (laughs) if you look at the movements of the planets, 
There's no wiggle room there. It's all by the clock. It's all by rule. And by the same token, that's how business has to work. It has to work like the solar system. So what he's really doing is transforming business according to this mathematical solar system model into something that's very familiar to us today. We're so used to blank forms. We're used to due dates. We're used to impersonal bureaucracies. We think of that just as modern life, you know, but modern life doesn't just drop out of the sky. Somebody has to make it. And Bowditch is one of those people who makes modern life. How long did it take Bowditch's ideas of standardized forms and impersonal practices and businesses to take hold in America? It takes a while. People are very taken aback. Those farmers feel that they're being dissed. You know, what do you mean? Why are you sending me warning letters that I have to pay on time or that I didn't pay on time? I'm a respectable man. In my community, people look at me and they say, look at that man. He works hard. Look at his farm. It's in good shape. And you're treating me like I'm some kind of deadbeat. So there was pushback, including political pushback as well. There were moves against the company to try to tax it in other ways just to oppose it. But it's not just ordinary people who were pushing back. Elite Bostonians themselves were used to working in a kind of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours way of doing things. So when Bowditch starts to enforce rules with them, they take exception to it. There's one stockholder, for example, who owes the company money on a particular date, but he decides to go to the seashore for the weekend instead. And Bowditch notices that this man is overdue, and he actually sends a messenger with a letter to the stockholder's seaside hotel. This is just not the way things are done. And the stockholder is completely amazed and probably enraged. So there's pushback, but people do eventually get used to it. In fits and starts, different communities get used to it at different rates. But eventually, by the late 1800s, certainly by the 1900s, we do get used to it so that we forget it was ever any other way. And that leads probably to the biggest irony of Bowditch's life story. He's probably best remembered now for that new American practical navigator, but nobody steers by the stars anymore, you know, not in the age of GPS. That's not happening. Where he made the most difference in regularizing business, business procedures, business conduct, office procedures, that has become so second nature that we don't even think of those revolutionary developments as having any origins. They've just always been there. So he's dropped out of sight where his most important contribution came. Now, earlier you mentioned that Bowditch was a fan of astronomy and that he hoped to regulate businesses like solar systems so that they'd operate with regularity. Could we talk a bit more about his interest in astronomy? Would you tell us about his interest in astronomy and in particular with the work of Pierre Laplace? Yes. So Laplace is another one of those names we don't really remember, right? We know Newton, and then we kind of skip ahead to Einstein. Well, in between was Pierre de Laplace, who's an 18th, early 19th century character. And he really represented the peak of enlightenment, mathematics, and physics and astronomy. And he wrote the series of volumes that in English translates as celestial mechanics. And these were seen as the crowning masterwork of the Enlightenment. So what's in them? Well, Isaac Newton, genius as he was, he left a lot of questions unanswered. It wasn't always clear how the movements of heavenly bodies followed natural law. Sometimes those movements of heavenly bodies could seem irregular. They're speeding up, they're slowing down. Well, Laplace takes the mathematics and the physics of the decades after Newton, he takes that and he explains everything. And he explains how everything is law-abiding. Things might look as if they're irregular. They might look as if the solar system is going to collapse inward or speed up or slow down. But actually, if you take this math, abracadabra, everything is regular. And that vision of eternal law-abiding regularity absolutely captivated Bowditch. Bowditch heard about Laplace. This was not a household name 
in the United States. The United States is behind the times when it comes to mathematics and science for a very long time. So how does Bowditch hear about Laplace? He orders books through the man who published his New American Practical Navigator. It's not, you can't just you know click on Amazon.com and get stuff. You have to know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who's going to ship something over on a vessel. So he gets in touch with his publisher, you know, get me the latest stuff. And he gets these volumes of Laplace and he takes them with him on his own voyage to Indonesia this time, I believe. And he's reading this stuff in French and he's absolutely captivated. It's a completely new mathematics. It's a brand new kind of calculus, the kind I personally suffered through in high school. But then it was brand new and kind of hieroglyphics to him. And he's very anxious to figure out what is this all about and what's in it. But it's vision, this Laplacian vision of eternal regularity, predictability, enthralls him. So he decides to make this his life's work, to understand Laplace. He's going to do that by translating him and by annotating him. And ultimately, by the 1830s, he publishes his own translation and annotation of Laplace. Bowditch's translation and annotation of Laplace's celestial mechanics is really interesting because Bowditch viewed the work as the pinnacle of his career, and yet it wasn't really received that way. Tamara, would you tell us more about Bowditch's work on Laplace's mathematics? Well, in America, it was. This was a, you know, not very many copies of this thing were issued. This is a niche book, if ever there was one, okay? Very few people in America could understand it. It's the kind of thing that even educated Americans would look at. They'd see all these unfamiliar hieroglyphic characters. They'd see all of these footnotes. It looked real learned to them. They'd say, wow, here's our American Newton. Look how tough this is. I can't make head or tail of it. So Americans thought, here's our American Newton. They were very proud of it. Europeans, at least the ones who were up to date in science and mathematics, they knew better. They looked at it. It was a very good translation. It was the first English translation. The annotations did make things more clear, but they recognized what was really going on. But you know what the annotations were, were helps to people who were not very sophisticated mathematically, who had to teach themselves, who had to figure it out for themselves. And Laplace was notorious in not connecting point A to point B very clearly. Now, if you knew calculus and you knew your science well, you didn't really need explanation. But for Americans who are mathematically unsophisticated, for Bowditch himself, they need all those intermediate steps pointed out to them. That's what Bowditch is doing. So people in the know say, you know what, this book is very useful for people who are not very sophisticated. And hey, that's what Americans are. On the other hand, they're surprised to find anything coming out of America of any level of sophistication. So they're quite patronizing in their praise, but Americans are quite deaf to that patronizing attitude. They just hear, great job, American. And they say, you see, we did it first. Look how great we are. We're no longer culturally backward. We're running with the big boys. Yeah. When did the perception of Americans being unsophisticated, backwards, and behind in math and science change in the world's worldview of the United States? You could say it's never changed, right? There's still kind of an expectation that we are rough and ready, that maybe we're practical people. But theoretically, sophisticated, artistically sophisticated, not so much. We're a bunch of roughshod populists. We're hardly intellectuals. I think we even have overtones in the European reaction to the situation in America today. What can you expect out of Americans? Rough and ready business guys with practical skills. Sure, Americans are happy to mistake that for skill in the complex, sophisticated world of geopolitics, right? So to some extent, that never went away. In the world of science, it's not really until the 20th century that we do, in fact, begin to run with the big boys. 
There are isolated scientists here and there who are making important contributions. Joseph Henry in the mid-19th century, Gibbs in the later 19th century. But as a power in the world of intellect and science, it's not really until the 20th century that America is accepted as part of the big leagues. As we've explored, Bowditch was a sailor, merchant, insurance actuary, investor, mathematician, and an astronomer. Tamara, given all these career feats, what do you think Bowditch's greatest legacy is and what was his greatest impact on early American society? Well, he would be happy if I would say, you know, he was an amazing mathematician, a path-breaking scientist, but he wasn't. His New American Practical Navigator has antiquarian interests, but not much more. It's really where he's most forgotten as a business executive that he had the greatest impact. And again, it's where he made these now invisible contributions to the experience of daily life, the fear of not getting your payment in on time the frustration of dealing with an impersonal bureaucracy. Rules are rules. We can't bend them. That's the way business works. Filling out forms, engaging with any kind of numbering system, whether it's zip codes or social security numbers or card catalog numbers, any of this kind of thing. This really bears the stamp of Bowditch, where numbers and system become part of our daily lives in a way that's just like breathing out and breathing in. That's about it. Let's get into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if Bowditch had not published A New American Practical Navigator? How would the lack of this publication have affected Bowditch's career and his legacy? Hmm. Well, I think it would definitely have affected his legacy as he's remembered today, but probably not so much his career. So people do remember The New American Practical Navigator. I was just giving a talk at the Mariner's Museum down in Virginia, and most of the audience was made up of retired merchant marine, retired Navy. They all knew Bowditch. They had their copies of Bowditch. Of course, these were very revised versions of Bowditch, but they still knew Bowditch. So to people in the maritime world, Bowditch is still a name because of the book he published. So if he hadn't published that, no interest, okay? He would not be known to the extent he is today. I don't actually think it would have affected his career that much. Bowditch himself didn't think that much of his practical manual. He wanted to be known for his mathematics and science. Not the practical stuff, the theoretical stuff, the Laplace stuff. And even if he'd never written that navigation manual, he was so driven by numbers. And he had the time to be driven by numbers. I firmly believe he would have done his math and science anyway. And I think he would have done the Laplace anyway. And I think he would have been a Laplacean business executive anyway. And probably pushed those blank forms and inviolable due dates anyway. What are you researching now, Tamara, that you've looked into the life of Nathaniel Bowditch? Well, I'm working on globes in the 18th and early 19th centuries, physical globes, and how those globes may have shaped a global imagination. Globes then weren't what they are now. They were expensive items. They came from Britain. They came in pairs, always in pairs, terrestrial and celestial globes, and they had these extra pieces on them that actually turned them into calculating instruments. And people learned something called the use of the globes, which were mathematical exercises using globes like scientific instruments. And they gave the people who studied the use of the globes a different way of thinking about global space 
And I think that they affected the way Americans thought about global affairs, like global trade and global politics, and the way Americans thought about how they linked up with other people around the globe. So I'm always interested in taking some kind of material practice or material object and seeing how it might have reflected ideas or even other way around, shaped ideas. So that's what I'm working on. If we still have questions about Nathaniel Bowditch or about math and science in early America, where can we find information about how to contact you? The best way would be to go to my webpage at the University of Buffalo. That's just history.buffalo.edu and then click on me and find me and you'll find my email and some other stuff about me. Happy to hear from people who are curious about Mr. Bowditch. Tamara Thornton, thank you for joining us today and for taking us through the rich and really interesting life of Nathaniel Bowditch. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Nathaniel Bowditch's greatest legacy is that of a business executive. His introduction of impersonal business procedures, paperwork, and the systematic ordering of nearly everything greatly changed the way early Americans conducted business and serves as the model for how we conduct business today. Of course, Bowditch would be disappointed if he knew this. As much as he wanted to order business and society so that they operated with the regularity of the solar system, he really wanted people to remember him as a great mathematician and astronomer. But as Tamara revealed, while Bowditch was talented at math and science, He just wasn't the intellectual equal of the European mathematicians and scientists he admired so much. Scholarly math just wasn't a thing in early America. Even Harvard didn't teach advanced mathematics in the early 19th century. Instead, Americans practiced and held up a more practical applied mathematics as their preferred form of math. This was the math that businessmen taught their apprentices. This was the math that surveyors used to calculate territorial boundaries. And this was the math that sea captains used to navigate the seas. Still, Bowditch had a deep interest in scholarly math, and he pursued a study of it on his own. And as Tamara noted, this wasn't an easy feat. Bowditch had to learn French and German just so that he could keep up with the literature and so he could read and translate works like Pierre de Laplace's Celestial Mechanics. Bowditch published some ideas, but he spent most of his time as a working mathematician and astronomer translating and annotating the work of others just so that he and other self-taught American mathematicians and astronomers could understand it. Bowditch's work was great, but it wasn't original. So Bowditch may not really have been Sir Isaac Newton's equal, but he did make many contributions to society. And he revealed possibilities for what America's homegrown mathematicians and scientists might one day become, the intellectual equals of Europeans. For more information about Tamara, her book, Nathaniel Bowditch and the Power of Numbers, plus links and notes for everything we talked about today, visit the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 140. As part of its work to support early American historical scholarship and to make that scholarship accessible, the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture made today's episode possible. It's also making it possible for archivists and scholars to digitize, interpret, and analyze the papers of the Georgian Kings of England with its support of the Georgian Papers Program. To learn more about the Georgian Papers Program and its partnership with the Omohundro Institute, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Georgian Papers. Lastly, what everyday practices fascinate you to the point that you'd like to know more about how they got started? Let me know. Send me an email to liz at benfranklinsworld.com Tweet me, at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.